God also uniquely makes or tailor makes situations uh, just for you to bring him glory. These are things that you are not uniquely qualified for, but that he's called you to do anyway so that he can prove that he is God. So we find ourselves in impossible situations, but what that does is it proves that God is the God over impossibility. God is the God who makes all things possible because he holds all things together through his powerful word. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So our life is meant to be lived in total reliance on God. We need him for everything, but we can easily take it for granted, right? It's the air in our lungs. He provides the pumping of our hearts, the other functions of our bodies. He's the creator and the sustainer of all things, holding all things together by his powerful word. And because of this, we need to rely completely on God for everything. Yes. Uh, but we often neglect this because we look at certain situations and we say this is way too big for even God to handle. Because it's too big for me, that means it's too big for God. And what we do when we do that is we bring God down to the level of man. But God is outside of man. He's outside of time. He's seated far above every ruler, every power, every authority. He's the authority that places authority in authority. Think about that. He's the God over all. He has all power. He has all rule. He has all authority. He is the God who created every single thing. But we're people. We're a little fickle. Uh, we waver even when we've seen God move before. Uh, and we think that God is no match for this current thing that we're facing in our lives. It's too big for him to handle. But God will tailor make, and he has tailor made situations for you to be in that seem scary, that seem big, that seem crazy. They're not easy. They may be the most difficult thing you've ever faced in your life. But he's uniquely placed that situation there for you to bring him glory. So today we're going to look at the life of Gideon and we're going to see how we can walk in victory in these impossible situations. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Judges chapter 6. And when you have it, just say, I got it. Got it. Amen, amen. Got it. You got it? You there? Online, you got it? Hallelujah. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, uh, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock in their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Uh, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Uh, we're going to jump down to verse 11. Uh, it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Aphra that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So he's hiding out from them. Uh, it says, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. 
Gideon replied, if I now have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. Put in the meat in a basket and his broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Afra of the Abia's rites. Hallelujah, the word of the Lord. So we look at the life of Gideon and we see that the Israelites are under the oppression of the Midianites because they've been rebellious to the Lord. And this is what the Lord told them in Deuteronomy. He said, if you obey all of these things in the law that I'm telling you, it's going to go well with you, your children, your children children's children uh, down to a thousand generations. But if you do not, then all of these things, these curses are going to actually come upon you. I'm going to give you over into other people's hands and they're going to oppress you uh, until you cry out. So they're at the moment where they've been so oppressed by the Lord that they're finally crying out to God and they're asking him to bring a deliverer. Uh, and so the Lord comes to seemingly the most unlikely of places because Gideon, he's the smallest clan, he's the smallest one in his family, and he's actually hiding from the Midianites threshing his wheat, because the wheat was actually thrust above ground, so he went down into a wine press to hide from the Midianites so that they wouldn't take it from him as they came to ravage the land. And so this guy is small, uh, he doesn't have much status, uh, he doesn't have really anything going for him. He's a farmer and he's probably very poor at the time as well. So what does he have that he can use to defeat the Midianites? But one thing that God uh, uh, does and loves to do is take the most unlikely of people and yeah. use them yeah. to bring God glory. Yeah. He said that, you know, I know you've heard it. God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the call because if you're qualified already, if Midian is some giant, uh, uh, awesome, strong warrior with a sword just waving around as he walks, it doesn't really matter what God does. If he goes and he defeats the Midianites, he can take the glory for that and say, I did this in my own strength. But God visited him and said, listen, I know you're small. I know you're, you're little. I know you're in the weakest clan. It's okay. I will go with you. And you, with me, with you, go and save your people Israel. So what do you have to do to walk in victory in an impossible situation? Something that God is calling you to. Because if you're a Christian and you're walking with God in obedience, you will find yourself in an impossible situation. And you have a choice to make. You can shrink back and run away from it. Or you can put your trust and your faith in the Lord to bring you through it. And so what you have to do in order to walk in victory in this situation is to stop looking at your qualifications. We talked last week about all the qualifications Moses had, but in this type of situation, this impossibility, you can't rely on your own qualifications, your upbringing, your status, your education, your money. You can't rely on these things to get you through because it just will not work. You are not qualified for an impossible situation or it wouldn't be an impossible situation. It would be a possible situation. But God puts us in these impossible situations to bring him glory. And so you must trust in the Lord and stop looking at your qualifications. What's interesting to me about the story of Gideon is God called him a mighty warrior before he ever went to war in his life. And that's what God does. He's the God who brings dead things 
to life and cause into being that which is not. He'll pull something on the inside of you out in order to bring a situation to pass that he wants to. So he's saying, Gideon, you're calling yourself small. You're calling yourself unworthy. You don't have the status or the upbringing or the proper training in war to do this. But what I'm saying is because of me, you are a mighty warrior. Stand up, stand strong, go into battle and defeat the Midianites and leave none of them alive. Amen. See, Gideon looked at his age. He looked at his size. He looked at his clan. He looked at his background. He looked at all of these things he didn't have, and it caused him to doubt the Lord. But one thing we have to do is stop trusting in our qualifications and trust completely in God because he has everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So what is God calling you to do that seems like an impossible situation? Who is he calling you to reach? What is he calling you to do in your city? How how is he calling you to change the landscape of your family? And it may seem impossible to you, but if you begin to stop looking inward and look towards the Lord, then yeah. you will get the strength to go and defeat this impossible situation. Yeah. Yeah. He can do it because Jesus Christ is the great equalizer. Yeah. What does he say? There's, there's, there, now, therefore, no Jew, nor Greek, no male, nor female, no slave, nor free. He's the great equalizer. So back then, those scales were imbalanced by all the people he was calling out. Well, men are up here. Women are down here. The slaves are down down here and those who are free are up here. The, the Jews are up here and the Greeks are down here. But Christ came and he tilted the scales and he's the great equalizer. So it does not matter what you do not have as long as you have him. Yes. You plus God is all you need. Yes. That's the math lesson for the day. You plus God is all that you Amen. need. That's good. The second thing I see Gideon <laughs> Do it. And Gideon's pretty funny. Uh, ju jump down to verse 36. And we're going to read to verse 40. So in between this, God calls him and he says, listen, you know, they got some Asherah poles, some idols, and they're worshiping them. I want you to just go and destroy them. So Gideon, he's still afraid. So he does it in the middle of the night so nobody will see him. Uh, but they found out it was him anyway, and they were trying to kill him. Uh, thank God his dad stepped in and he said, listen, I know he tore down the altar to Baal, but if Baal truly is a God, let Baal defend himself. And so he saved Gideon from getting killed by the people of Israel. Uh, and so this is verse 36. God is calling him and he's saying, uh, go and defeat the Midianites because the Midianites have now not just came through to ravish the land and take the crops and things. They have actually joined forces with other people in the land and they're set up to go to war against Israel. So now this impossible situation turns into somebody got to do this or the Israelites are going to be completely destroyed. So Gideon, he says to God in verse 36, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you promised, look. I'll place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's dew only on the fleece and the rest of the ground is dry, then I'm going to know that you'll save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that's what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew of a bowl full of water. The rest of the ground was dry. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. <laughs> <laughs> Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered in dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. And <laughs> so I want to just tell you, you know, if you're unsure, you may be uncertain. You may be saying, I mean, did you really like is, uh, this sounds pretty crazy. You know, am I making this up? Is this you really calling me to do this? It's fine. But what you have to do is get the confirmation and then just go. You, you know, we don't need 17, 20, 25, 35 confirmations of what the Lord has already told us to do. And oftentimes we know it's what he called us to do, but we're asking for confirmation because we're living out of fear. And we don't really want to step out on what he said. But if you get the confirmation the first time, just step out in faith and do it. 
Just go because God is backing you. And I'm telling you, it was not the devil that was telling Gideon to go and defeat the enemy army. It wasn't his flesh telling him to go do it. It was the Lord. And there are situations that we find ourselves in where we're saying, hmm, maybe this is just my flesh telling me to go witness to this person. Maybe this is just the devil telling me that my city needs to be transformed by my hand. That's not the devil or the flesh. Why would the devil want you to change the landscape of a city and bring God glory in anything? That's not the devil's job. That's not what he does. So if you get the confirmation from God, just go out and do it. One thing you have to stop is letting fear dictate and rule your life. See, fear is a bully. Fear will beat you down. It will smack you up, turn you upside down, get your lunch money, and go spend it right in front of your face. You cannot let fear dictate what it is you do or do not do. And oftentimes, we get into these situations, and we're living under fear and oppression, and we're not living under the fear of the Lord. See, because if we fear God more than the situation, then we'll still go out and do it. Do it in faith. Do it in faith. See, that's why they call it a leap of faith. Because when you're jumping into your father's, or there's a space between there where stuff can happen. But if you believe in faith, hey, my father's on the other side of this. His arms are outstretched and everlasting. And he will catch me as I jump. Then I'm going to make the leap of faith. See, when Judah, when we pick her up, Sometimes, I don't know if y'all seen me, but I, I grab her by her legs and I, and I lift her up into the air. And so I've been doing that. I lift her up and then I drop her down real quick. And what she started to do when she's in the air is she just leans her body all the way forward. It, but she's doing it because she's trying to get to me. Because she knows that I'm a safe space and that I'm going to catch her every single time. She's not been dropped one time yet since I've had her holding her up and down. And she's seen through past circumstances that I'm trustworthy and she can lean over all the way if she wants to get back down from out of the air. What has God shown you in your past already where he's saying, I've delivered you before, I've been with you before, I've set up this situation before, I've done this thing in your life to where you can see that I'm trustworthy. So why are you having trouble following me this time? See, it's supposed to be almost like the breadcrumbs that keep leading you uh, to the place that you're going. Okay, God, he delivered this. He saved people in my family. Oh, I've seen a miracle in my life. Oh, he healed my body. Oh, he healed my mind. Oh, other people, I see them getting delivered and transformed. Oh, he financially increased my life. Oh, there's another breadcrumb. So whenever we're off of the trail, we can think back and say, okay, this is a crazy situation. I see it's a lot of woods over here. Do I have to break this stuff down? No, actually, there's a path that's already been charted through God's history with me and what he's shown in my life and in the history of other people around me. And that's part of the reason why we do testimonies. So you can say, you know what? Maybe I haven't gotten my income double, but I know he's faithful because he's done it for a sister of mine. God is a provider. And so if he provides for one, well, hold on. I'm also his child. I'm his son. That means he's going to provide for me as well. And so if I'm in an impossible situation, I know that there's a way out because the God of the universe is with me. Let's go to chapter 7 real quick. We'll read 1 through 8. Uh, it says, early in the morning, Jeroboam, that was the name they gave Gideon after he tore down that idol. Uh, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands. Or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. That's pretty crazy. He had 32,000 people with him. But the Lord said to Gideon, verse 4, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will fend them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men 
down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300, wait, hold on, not the 9,700, no, with the 300 <laughs> that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now, if you read through the rest of the story, chapter 7 into chapter 8, uh, they defeat the Midianites. Uh, the Lord is with them, with only 300 people against the Midianites, the Amalekites, and some other people that joined together. Uh, uh, Gideon thought he had plans and he thought that he needed all 32,000 people to go to war against the Midianites. But what God said is, no, you don't need 32,000. You only have 300 that will go with you. And what happens sometimes is God will begin to strip us of the plans that we may have even made in good faith. And he'll begin to remove things from us and say, you don't need that, you don't need that, you don't need that. And what we're left with can seem scary or like we're lacking. But in reality, we have everything that we need because God said so. We don't need 32,000 to defeat the army. We don't need, all we need is 300 who, who drink the water out of their hands. That's all that we need in order to go forth in the strength and the power of God. That's it. That's it. You may feel like you're lacking. You may feel like you don't have enough. You may feel like God has stripped you of everything. But what he's doing is he's getting ready to catapult you into yeah. victory by doing that because he wants the glory alone. He doesn't want you to be able to say, listen, I, I made my plan. I got the troops. I trained all of them. I, I, I took them from A to B and I taught them how to fight and how to shoot guns and things. And then we went into the war and we won. I did it with my own strength. No, he wants you to say, I could not do it in my own strength. And if it wasn't for the Lord, he would have been completely defeated. However, with the 300 people that he gave me who just lapped the water out of their hands, we went and we defeated several different armies. Scrap your plans. Make them. But be ready to scrap them. You can make them in good faith, but be ready to scrap them. Do not idolize your own plans over God's strategy. Because what I see oftentimes is when we're ready, we got the confirmation, we're going to go. We don't often ask God how we should do it. We just say, all right, I got the confirmation. I'm just running with it. I'm just going to do it. And we're flying by the seat of our pants. And we have these plans that now we have to get rid of. And oftentimes what happens is an internal struggle. Because you say, I spent all of my time. I spent all of my energy. I put all of this stuff together. And now God is telling me to get rid of it. God, are you serious right now? You saw the work that I put into it. You saw all the time that I spent, the sleepless nights, the things that I put together in order to get me to hear to do what you called me to do. But God would say, no, you didn't actually listen all the way. Just get rid of the plan and we're going to go for it. Don't be afraid. I know you put your time and energy in it, but guess what? This is going to be the better way. This will be the better way. No one will touch God's glory. No one will touch God's glory. Right. Be ready to scrap your plans. Do not idolize your plan over God's strategy. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. See, Gideon was the smallest. He was the weakest. His clan was the weakest. He didn't, he didn't have anything that would say that he could defeat the Midianites. They were far more numerous and they had been coming through and ravishing the land of Israel for seven years. For seven years and no one could defeat them. But then one day God sees a little small man, a little weak man, a poor man who's hiding from the Midianites. And he's saying, I can't do it. Someone who's saying, God, you got to show me several times in order for me to fully believe that you're going to deliver the Midianites from my hand. I... I saw the miracle with the dew, but I still don't believe you. Okay, I saw the dew again. I still don't. I saw you actually consume the offering I made with fire. I 
still don't believe you. I'm too small. But God said, no, you're a mighty warrior. You are a mighty warrior. Because you plus God is everything that you need. Worship team, you can come on up. So you may be facing an impossible situation today. You may be about to go into an impossible situation. You may have had several impossible situations. But the way that we view them, our perspective on them dictates the outcome of them. Because if we go into an impossible situation and we only look at what we're not qualified to do, we only look at how big the situation is, how big the problem is, and we don't look at the God over the problem or the situation, then we'll never succeed in what God has called us to do. We need a perspective shift on these impossible situations. Amen? Amen. Now... I always want to take this time before I give the, the call, and we're just going to pray today, stand up and pray, but I never want to miss an opportunity for someone to get their life right with the Lord. Jesus is the greatest thing that ever happened to my life. He is the single greatest that ever happened to my life. I remember being a broken kid. I remember there was so much turmoil growing up. I remember being depressed and down. I remember days where I just didn't want to wake up the next day. But when I gave my life to the Lord, there was just this joy that welled up on the inside of me. It was true joy, not pretend, laughter, not smiling, not faking. It was true joy that welled up into my life. And I began to have a new outlook. I began to say, God, you created me for something. I'm here for a reason. And if I don't do anything else with my life, I'm going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day hasn't been amazing. I would lie if, if I would say that. But I will tell you that if I look back at all my days, there's nothing that I would change. I would never go back. Jesus Christ is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And if you would say today, if you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus, if you would say, I am not sure of my eternal destination. When Jesus returns, if God forbid I was to pass soon, I don't know if I would be with the Lord Jesus. We want to give you an opportunity to give your life to him in-house and online. Or maybe you say, I've walked with Jesus for a while, but I just have kind of strayed away from him. Life has happened. Circumstances, situations have pulled me away. And my relationship with him just is not what it was. We want to give you an opportunity to just reconnect and recommit to the Lord Jesus Christ. So just every eye closed, every head bowed. If that's you today and you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus or recommit your life to the Lord Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand boldly for me. And online, if that's you, just type in the chat and say, that's me. We're going to reach out and pray for you. That's you in the house, and you know that you need to get your life right with the Lord Jesus. He loves you so much. Just lift your hand to the Lord boldly. Hallelujah. And then here's the other call. If you're in an impossible situation, or the way you've gone through them in the past, your perspective has been completely wrong. If you've been looking at your own qualifications, if you've been letting fear dictate your life and what you do or don't do for the Lord, 
Or maybe you have all these great plans and you're trying to do it in your own strength. And today you want to say, you know what? I'm going to just trust fully and completely in the Lord for this situation. Just go ahead and lift your hand for me. those who may not have the status or the wealth, those who may not have everything going for them, Lord God, but those who will trust completely in you and what it is you called them to do. Lord, I thank you for gracing them. I thank you for strength over them. I declare over their lives, Lord God, that they will run this race strong in Jesus' name, that fear will not dictate their lives, Lord God, that their lack of qualifications will not dictate their lives, and that their plans that they have will not dictate their lives, but they will be fully submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I declare over every person in here and every person watching freedom in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I declare over them, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go forth and defeat the enemies of the Lord because he is with you. And so in the name of Jesus, I declare every impossible situation must bow before the name yes. of Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. That it cannot stand up to the Lord Jesus because you are in control over everything. So God, we honor you, we bless you, we trust you, and we lift up your holy name. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you and we will see you.